welcome to another week. And this week, my, I have, I'm very excited to introduce our guest is Michael Menduno. He's an award-winning reporter and technologist who's written about diving and diving technology for 30 years. He, he's credited with coining the term technical diving, and he is the founder and publisher of Aquacore, the journal for technical diving. He also, this magazine helped usher technical diving into the mainstream of sports diving and organized the first tech, uh, Eurotech and Asia tech conferences, as well as Rebreather 1 and 2. He is, he is also the, chief, uh, the editor-in-chief of, uh, of GUE's in-depth online magazine, contributing editor for Dan Europe and X-Ray Magazine. He's a contributing writer for Deeper Blue, and he is also on the board of directors of the Historical Diving Society. All right. You can get him to jump on in. Hey, Mike. Hey, everybody. Hey, Joe. How you doing? I'm doing good. Really uh, happy and grateful to be here with you guys. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning over there in the West Coast. So what time is it over there? It's uh, 10 o'clock. Sunny morning. I got in my tether swim this morning before the talk, so I'm I'm feeling good. <laughs> oh, that's awesome! Yeah, yeah. I wish I could. Yeah, I don't have a pool around, and so I can't jump in the water. So I have to go find a spring or something. But right. yeah, so really good to have you. We're gonna we've got some really exciting exciting stuff lined up to talk about, uh, including a, a video too. Uh, we're gonna be talking mostly about uh, the past, how you got your start. You know, the story of Aquacore magazine. Um, that's all, that's one of the cooler magazines that I've ever found of diving. And it was really like influential for getting me into technical diving. So, so yeah. So, uh, yeah, t you know, tell us a little bit about the story of Aquacore. You know, what is, what's, uh, the Aquacore magazine? Story of Aquacore. So, um, I grew up, of course, always uh, watching Jacques Cousteau and, and Sea Hunt for those that remember those uh, shows. So uh, always uh, remember the site when the silent world came up. So uh, when I moved to California, I, I grew up in the Midwest. When I moved to California to go to graduate school, I mm -hmm. learned to dive. I can still remember my first breath on a regulator in the pool at Browley's uh, scuba diving. It was I still remember it. It was exciting. <laughs> anyway, so I uh, started diving in California. Uh, learned to dive uh, Lover's Point in Monterey. Uh, and then I went away for a while. I went, uh, I was on an internship in Washington, D.C. when I finished my graduate degree at Stanford, came mm -hmm. back, got back into diving, was a petty dive master. And there was a group called Cordell Explorers. It was um, a citizen science group made up of some uh, software engineers from Silicon Valley. They had a boat and they were looking for volunteers to go do bio essays of the deep sea mounts off the coast of Big Sur, California. So uh, this was like really exciting. So I applied. Yeah, that's super exciting. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I applied, got accepted. And you had to do your checkout dives. I had to rig up a set of doubles. It was my first doubles. We had uh, steel 72s, so those are maybe like seven liter tanks uh, with a mm -hmm. manifold bar, which now that I think about it, was scary. You know, one, one big whack and you'd lose all your gas. <laughs> and so the idea was we were doing these dives to 50 and 60 meters, which at the time was just, you know, outrageous because – in those days, it was like no stop diving, nothing to see below 40 meters, don't ever go there, et cetera. And uh, so we had a boat and an a inflatable. We were diving off the inflatable. And these were short dives, 15, 20 minutes, uh, air dives. Uh, they didn't allow dive computers because dive computers were sort of new. So we had Navy tables, no wow. deco gas at all, you know, but... It was so exciting. And um, around that time, I was going through a midlife crisis. I had been in the computer industry, in marketing, and uh, decided I wanted to become a writer and a diver. And so my first story I ever did uh, was about this. I was going to do a story about this expedition. So I mm -hmm. contacted pretty much every scuba magazine out there, and no one would touch it. You know, it was like, yeah, you're not supposed to do that. Uh, sport divers, you're not supposed to go below 40 meters. Uh, deco dives? Are you kidding me? Crazy madman. 
Yeah, yeah. So uh, eventually there was one publisher, a guy named Ken Lois at Discover Diving, and he agreed to run my story, but he put caveats all through it. You know, warning, this is not for sport divers, sport divers should never, you know, all the caveats. But it ran. And um, so as I started, and I was just hungry for information about this. This was like the most, I'm sure most of the people watching this know that feeling like, oh my God, I got to do this. So right. I started That's researching it and uh, discovered cave diving and other groups uh, in the Northwest, uh, people like Gary Gentile and all, who were doing deep dives on the Doria. But all this stuff was totally in the closet, hush, hush, uh, because you weren't supposed to do it. It was taboo in sport diving. And uh, super, I secret also, diving. super secret. And there was also a concern that, you know, if people, if we talked about this, people would go out and try and kill themselves. So. So that was the atmosphere, and I, but I was, again, hungry for information. So my idea was, hey, why don't I just start a newsletter to talk about this because I wanted the information. So uh, that basically ended up being Aquacore. It started as a newsletter, um, no, a magazine newsletter, but we're black and white. We may, we have, we may have an initial covey. Well, these are all of them. This one in the upper left-hand corner, that was the first one called Under Pressure. Each Under of the issues sure, yeah. themed, right. And uh, in this, we called what this new kind of diving was, didn't know quite what to call it. So we called it high-tech diving because it was using, you know, mixed gas technology, mm -hmm. um, basically. And uh, that was in 1990. I went to DEMA at 1990 with my first issue, Hot Off the Press. And we had a big booth, you know, a small booth, but it said, do you dive deep? You know, do you do decompression diving and some big signage? And I remember uh, Al Hornsby from Patty and a group of Patty all came over and picked up the magazine and kind of walked off, you know, and they were, Anyway, that, that got the ball rolling and, uh, you know, the rest is history, basically. Yeah. yeah. Tech diver. What a cool start. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, it was, you were doing something that was very exciting, but it was very taboo. And it was very much like, you know, if I can't find the information out there, I'm going to go and find it out and do it myself. And so that's, I know, at least when I started diving and people started talking about technical diving, I was just scouring the internet for information. Yeah. Yep, that, that hunger. And, yeah. and for me, coming out of the computer industry, I recognized it for what it was. Um, in the computer industry, uh, probably some of you will remember, there was the personal computer revolution. Computing yeah. went around, used by governments and then companies. And Steve Jobs had the, well, I think the PC was actually first, but... They had the great idea, gee, what if we brought this this tool to consumers and then they could take it from there? I think Steve Jobs had the bicycle for your mind, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, and it was a technological revolution. It was called the PC revolution. So it was just obvious to me what was going on was exactly parallel. Uh, mixed gas technology had been developed by the Navy in the 1930s. Then the commercial divers picked it up in the 60s in order to go deeper to service oil wells. And now it's coming around to us consumers to take it to go where no one had gone before. So uh, yeah. I started calling it the technical dive once we had the name, which I uh, coined a year later, 1991, the technical diving revolution. So. And, and you say, you told me before that you got kind of the name to coin it technical from kind of like rock climbing and mountaineering because more advanced thing. We didn't know what to call it. You know, as Bill Hamilton was saying, well, let's, we'll call it high tech diving. In fact, that first issue, that was his article, we'll call it high tech diving. And, you know, we had tried advanced diving or uh, just different words, but nothing worked. And so uh, mm -hmm. in 1991, I had friends who were rock climbers, technical climbing, you know, with numbered systems. And uh, mm -hmm. I thought, well, wow, that just seemed to have all the right ingredients. So in Aquacore and actually technical diver, we uh, I started using the word technical diving. And that quarter, uh, the third quarter of uh, 1991, Drew Patty was getting lots of pressure, like, God, these guys are doing this. Why aren't why, why isn't Patty doing it? So yeah. Drew Richardson, uh, who was then a vice president, now CEO of Patty, wrote an article in the Undersea Journal called Technical Diving. Does Patty have its head in the sand? And that cemented the name. So in That's some ways, I mean, they are partially responsible for uh, for uh, technical diving, the term. Yeah, That's yeah, it's it's such a cool like a cool history like behind the scenes of how it started, and so 
Yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, so like, well, let's talk a little bit about kind of the early emergence of like mixed gas technology, like the pioneers adoption, like, you know, adopting of cave and rec, you know, uh, a lot right. of, you know, we have a kind of our audience is like a lot of, uh, you know, technical, technically minded scuba divers and people that either want to get into tech diving or have been technical diving for a while, including rebreathers, caves, wrecks, you know. And so, like, the persistence of, like, deep air and arguments of, like, running high PO2, you know, kind of the early days of mixed gas diving. So, tech diving really came out of the cave diving community, in, in my mind. Cave divers had figured out configuration pretty much. And they were, you know, a lot of the cave exploration was was deep air. Uh People were routinely diving to 80 meters, 100 meters on air, even trickier in a cave than open water because you've got to come yeah. back instead of just yeah, go through it. Yeah. And, uh, so some of our early pioneers, and, and there was some um, mix wasn't, uh, well, how, how do I want to put this together? So mm -hmm. people like Sheck Exley, Jochen Hasselmeyer in uh, Europe, you know, in order to go deeper to explore these caves, realize that they're going to need something other than air. Sheck was uh, obviously uh, able to handle narcosis at deep depth, but, you know, it just wasn't enough. So if you can imagine this, in the mid and early 80s, people like Yokan and uh, Sheck were making dives to five and 600 feet, solo dives on mix, when the mm -hmm. rest of the industry didn't even know the word nitros, you know. So, yeah. so it really started as I said, in small groups. So Sheck, Sheck Exley and his group, people were doing that, uh, the West Skiles, et cetera. Um, uh, Bill Gavin, uh, the early people of WKPP, uh, Parker Turner who started it, uh, Bill Gavin. Yeah, there's a picture of them. Bill Main and Lamar English. They started working uh, with Dr. Bill Hamilton, a noted dive physiologist um, who actually gave us a lot of credibility. You know, we were regarded as the wild and crazies back in the day and uh, may not have gotten an audience with the recreational dive industry, but Bill Hamilton came along who had a lot of credibility in commercial and government diving and saying, hey, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a Key West diver. Uh, came along and said, hey, these guys make sense. So started in the cave community. Um, Billy Beans was another character. He really brought it to the rec community. He was uh, him. He was a longtime diver. He had a dive store, Key West Diver. That was a picture of us there. Mm -hmm. uh, his best friend died on a deep air dive in the Andrea Doria in 1987, I believe. And after that, Billy said, you know, there's got to be a better way to do this. And so he started looking into mixed gas technology and created a, a gas panel and started learning mixed gas diving. At that, at that point, everyone, it was just self-taught, right? So, um, so that was the basic communities, the cave community. And then Billy started working with the uh, Northwest Northeast wreck divers, uh, mm -hmm. First to bring oxygen decompression and then later mix gas. So they got into it kicking and screaming a bit. I think the cave community really adopted it sooner. Yes. I mean, it grew out, it grew out of a, a kind of a, a necessity, you know, like you were saying, after that fatality on the Andrea Doria, it was like, you know, we have to come up with another way. Otherwise, people are going to keep dying. And so. Yeah. And, and it was a Billy was very, you know, this was a serious time. Uh, certainly, um, at Billy's opening trade, you go to train with Billy. It wasn't a course. You just go down and book a week or two weeks. And we had a series of uh, shipwrecks from the Cayman Salvager at uh, 20 some meters, the curb at 60 meters, 50 meters, to the Wilkes Bear at, you know, 70 meters and, and deeper, uh, 60 meters and deeper. And so people would train up. But on the opening day of class, yeah. Billy Deans mm -hmm. would say, you know, we're here to have a good time, but you got to take this seriously. And he would play the video of the body recovery of his best friend being hauled up onto the Wahoo. So if, you know, and his, his idea was if you don't do everything perfectly right, you're going to die. So you better do things right. So that was kind of the yeah. back then. It, it's, such a, it's a different mentality in terms of like the, the kind of ex explaining the mortality of it. You know, there is the seriousness of it that sometimes people don't want to talk about, but that's the transparency that it's important to acknowledge. And, and also in the same point of like, 
you know, it is, we're doing this to have fun. It is recreational. It's a sport, you know, we're not, we're not going to collecting, you know, a job. We're not working at depth, you know? And so, right. The, right. you know, the, fatality. Well, we, have the we, we have the important job of, of exploration. Humans mm -hmm. have to explore. It's part of our genetic mm -hmm. makeup. The commercial divers aren't doing it. The military divers aren't doing it. We're doing right. it. So that's, that's kind of our job in a way, though. It's fun. Yeah, the in you know the kind of the early days of fatalities, um, you know they were much more prevalent. It's you know nowadays there's probably like you know a couple of fatalities a year versus how they were in the early '90s and the '80s. Well, <clears throat> unlike again, think about it. So the military and commercial people had money, infrastructure, mm -hmm. uh, authority, centralized diving. I mean, it was. They had authority on the boat, you know, mm -hmm. right. And so they proceeded and they, they had accidents, of course, but they sorted it out. The sport diving community had none of those things, no money, no, you know, it was just yeah. everyone it was a do it yourself. And as a result, there were a lot of fatalities in the early days. And in fact, in 1992, we were worried that this was just going to shut down tech diving. I think. Uh, the summer of 92, we had about eight fatalities, uh, Andrea Doria, Ginny Springs, et cetera, and injuries. And then that fall, this uh, beloved uh, father and son team, the Rouses, Rouses died uh -huh. on the, on the Yoo Hoo. Uh, mm -hmm. Ironically, though, they were mixed train. They were doing an air dive on air the Yoo Hoo, which was at about 70 plus meters, and died. So, you know. The recreational diving, they were happy that we weren't called recreational diving anymore. We were called technical diving, but it was, you know, we were still regarded as the wild and crazies. And uh, we were worried that OSHA would step in, the government would step in and start regulating sport diving because of those fatalities. Most of them were, uh, I think we have a they need some regulation. <laughs> I, I just published um, in in-depth, we just published uh, 44 fatalities from the early days of uh, the, the early days uh, that people can look at following Sheck Axley's sort of accident analysis uh, approach. Mm -hmm. And uh, we could do that back then. When someone died, I mean, I would get a call like, oh, God, we just, there was an accident at Ginny Springs or wherever. And I would actually call and we, we could do the reporting. You know, n nowadays when someone dies, that's it. You don't hear anything, right? It's just all rumor and, and trolling. It's crazy. It's crazy. And then the, the internet kind of festers. And so you have all this speculation and then you have people that are saying like, we can't speculate till any report comes out. And then a year goes by nothing happens. And then the report just kind of fades away, fades from memory. And so it's, it's terrible. Mm -hmm. It's sad. We're, we're the losers really the, the dive community because right? we can't learn from those incidents. Um, in the early days, probably about, I think in that Aquacore database, probably about a third, roughly a third of them were due to bad, you know, wrong mix at depth. That that killed a lot of people, switching to the wrong yeah. cylinder. It was all open circuit, primarily 99% open circuit back then, but people switching to the wrong mix at depth, uh, not labeling. Ah, this is from uh, nit Nitrox. We'll, we'll have to talk about Nitrox, but yeah, anyway, so it, was a, it was a time. After that, I think that 92, we well, at AquaCore, we created something like Check's Blueprint for Survival, Blueprint for Survival 2.0, and we tried to find the best practices from around the diving community. Um, and I think we have an image of uh, the Blueprint 2.0, but uh, best practices around the diving community. Um, you know, uh, WKP was developing their standards, the DIR standards, which ended up, you know, uh, moving to GUE. And there was really a focus on better training too, because there weren't even courses in the early days. You just learned how to do it from someone who knew how to do it, you know, like that. So they were uh, interesting times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I see. I see kind of that uh, that common denominator from side mount diving, and then um, you know now with um, you know side mount CCR and side mount uh, or and bailout rebreathers, it's. You know, at least when I started diving, there there was no certification for side mount. It was you just kind of learn and you talk to people that have been doing it and then you figure it out. Now there's courses and side mount instructors and whatnot. And so and it's it's good, but there is a 
there is a developmental period where the training has to catch up with the technology. And so, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, it's, um, it, it, it was some interesting times. And then, you know, and then now we had that label pop up of the, the nitrox wars, you know, the, it's Voodoo, yes. too dangerous to breathe on air or too so, dangerous to breathe. Nitrox. Yeah. Right. So the, so the nitrox star story started in uh, also in the late eighties, a guy named Dick Rakowski, who had been um, the deputy dive director at NOAA, the national association mm -hmm. of atmospheric, administration I, I, I knew that name. No, uh, <laughs> um, and he retired and he thought you know and they had developed nitrox uh, nitrox one and two a 32 mix and a 36 mix yeah. and uh, the government was using it for diving uh commercial divers were using it a little um i think they were using it um so rakowski said well gee we could bring this to consumers and Dick Rakowski, for those who know him was really a character i mean one of his famous quotes about uh, air diving it's like uh, diving on air is like having sex without a condom. You know, the technology is there. You're stupid not to use it. You can't get so, yeah. Luck's going to run out. So he did not get on. The recreational diving community sort of regarded him as a bit of a crank <laughs> and an odd element. <laughs> and this was, of course, Nitrox was not, I mean, tech divers used it for deco, but this was for recreational divers, right? So... Uh, in 1992, that year, from pressure as a result of pressure from the Cayman Water Sports Association, who did not want people staying down longer and were worried that people with all the walls might go too deep and tox on nitrox. So they put pressure on Skin Diver Magazine, which was the diving media of the day, uh, with a circulation of about 250,000, I think, to uh, ban nitrox. So uh, they got to Bob uh, Gray at DEMA. And they actually said no nitrox. They, I have a letter to Dick Rakowski from Bob Gray returning his deposit. Can you imagine in diving for his booth at DEMA? Because no vendors. So this was, yeah, we were distraught. So we, I organized with some other people. We organized the Enriched Air Nitrox Workshop to take place right before DEMA, bring everybody together so we could bash this out. That warning that you saw was the first page of the DEMA directory saying, warning, nitrox cannot be used with scuba equipment, which is not true. Yeah, the, the warning right there. So, uh, right on the first page of so everyone's seeing it, every shop seeing it, every instructor is seeing it, everyone. Wow. It was the best advertising we could get, right? Because everyone opened the book and went, what's nitrox? It's and so they had the Buddha guess. That term was coined by uh, Bill Gleason, the editor of um, – Skin Diver Magazine, they ran a series of editorials in the fall, like Just Say No to Nitrox or the 130 foot red line. You know, there's nothing to see down here, people. So um, anyway, but and, and, yeah, and the other thing, here's this picture here. The other thing was about blending standards. Uh, there was kind of a war about this. The INTD people were looser about gas blending. You had Ed Betts, on the other hand, who, um, was you know for air what uh, oilless oil free compressors. Uh, so anyway, this is a after about a four hour knockdown battle between the two that we helped moderate. The INTD people and the Andy people agreed on a mixing standard uh, for blending uh, nitrox. Uh, TDI wasn't around then, and PSA, uh, Hal Watts training organization, PSAI now. Uh, they weren't involved in this in this early period. So it was just INTD and Andy coming together. Andy, if you'll remember, called it safe air. That's that's what they called nitrox, which didn't stick. Yeah, it's that's kind of like it's 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 too similar, right? It's like safe air. What is that, you know? And so right. it's uh, yeah, but at nitrox, uh, we, we always, used to always joke at the at the neutral buoyancy lab, we dive fifty percent, and so mm -hmm. we always joke about nitrox being the name of a Godzilla's villain or something, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. So, so anyway, it, it became, and then it took a few years. I think it wasn't until 1995. So that was 92, uh, January 92. By 1995, I think that was the year Patty introduced its nitrox class, BSAC, pretty much everyone else. So then it became ubiquitous well it's still not ubiquitous but almost so well now you know now they bundle it with open water courses so 
As they should. As as yeah. GUE, the, the meme from GUE, compressed air is four tires. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> like that. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have a, a little video too. It's it's about the big dive and the seriousness of the of the diving, the tech diving back there in the day. So so let me give a little intro. So um this was again very serious times. Billy Deans was a taskmaster. I mean, he had a good time, but you had to work and focus and be disciplined. Very serious guy. And so uh, in a lighter moment, we decided, he decided, uh, we talked about this to make this video called The Big Dive, which, which kind of kind spoofs. spoofs. Come on, come on. So enjoy, enjoy. Keep an, Keep an eye, eye on the earliest days of recorded history. Man's genetic quest for adventure has led him to travel the vast expanses of the mighty oceans to far off lands of exotic beauty and hidden dangers. By using contemporary techniques, the explorers were able to push beyond the boundaries and reap untold rewards of beauty and self satisfaction. Perfect. Exit. Stage left. Bill. Quality assurance is the key to any deep sea diving operation. All life support equipment must be operated at 110% efficiency and all high pressure cylinders must be filled to their rated capacity. With the design and construction of our mixed gas blending panel in 1988, Key West Diver Incorporated was enabled to optimize safety and performance of the untethered diver in the underwater marine environment. Take it away. Again, quality assurance is a must for the right mix. Here, our gas technician is seen preparing a special blend oh, called good. Trimix. Trimix, a combination of helium, nitrogen, and oxygen, is our primary bottom mix for the depths beyond. Here, the valued assistant shows us the standard color coding of an enriched air nitrox stage bottle which is used during a deep sea trimix operation to augment safety during the decompression phase of the dive. Okay, rolling, wait, slap it. <laughs> the next critical stage is oxygen analysis. Oxygen management exposure is key to conducting any deep sea hyperbaric exposure. Here, Dr. Joe is testing for oxygen content on a recent batch of enriched air nitrox. His seal of approval means the mixing methods have not been compromised. Ready? Wow. Clap it. And... Joe, here we go. We're going to throw the dice. Yes, that's it. What do we have? <laughs> 12. That's a 12. All right. Look at Christopher. Okay, here we go. <laughs> here we go. And another roll coming up. And he we have a 14. Set of tape, 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 <laughs> well, well, that's very good. Yes, yes. Gas supply is the single most critical aspect of any dive. With advancements in composite fiber technology and metallurgy, total gas supply available for the diver is dramatically increased without a corresponding change in physical size. This is this is B and D on Kendra and Dan Dan Bird Bird filming filming. Current research and development for open circuit scuba at Key West Diver Incorporated is keying on carrying the equivalent of seven 80 cubic foot aluminum cylinders in a twin cylinder configuration. However, as in all R&D programs, there are certain snags to be overcome. <laughs> Incidentally, the test pilot diver is requ recovering quite nicely. Another technique used extensively with justification by the cave diving community is the use of the long hose for your primary. With a minimum length of 5 feet and ranging up to 9 feet, such a proven simple, simple safety procedure is at the center of a major controversy. How to stow the excess hose, what length, and whether or not to actually use the elongated octopus as your primary are the main questions. This is what we call the modified marine Hogarthian method. Homage, Homage to WWP.
Another useful technique employed by Key West Diver Incorporated is the use of diver propulsion vehicles, or DPVs, more affectionately known as litoporitos. The electromechanically delivered thrust is key to transporting a cylinder-laden diver to the wreck, even in the face of a strong current, as evidenced in Gary Gentile's 1990 Monitor expedition. Not only is the physical exertion of swimming obviated, which increases the diver's physiological safety, it drops the gas consumption rate of the dive team, which allows for options such as a longer bottom time or, in the case of problems, more bottom mix to effectively deal with the situation. The DPVs not, need not be a hindrance during the decompression phase of the dive. You can actually use the current to your advantage, as seen here. The dive team has connected the DPVs together with their emergency tow lines and are enjoying the 20-foot surface-applied 100% oxygen decompression stop. Billy had, Billy had a surface applied supply dough. Again, as with any technologically advanced machine, quality assurance and maintenance might not be enough. As with the cowboys of the Wild West, if you take care of your ride, it'll take care of you. Honey, how was your day? I have missed you. Have you missed me? You're my favorite machine. May I have this, Dad? Why, thank you. Perfect. Look familiar, familiar wow. people. Oh, I love and you. caress. <laughs> Gonna get some, gonna get some. <laughs> these are these are the <laughs> The philosophy of total independence and redundancy is a must in the extremes of the marine environment. Is that Kendrick Kendrick die? Knowing the team's surface consumption rate, staying within proven guidelines for gas management at depth, and carrying your backup, intermediate, and final decompression gas mixes sometimes makes for a few cylinders. Control over equipment and technique is a crucial aspect of any training program, as is an understanding of the conditions in which the sport is performed. Nowhere is this aspect more relevant than in the overhead environment created by wreck penetration. The U boat boat in, in Florida. Florida. By building up one's experience base slowly and training with proven professionals, the individual diver has a sense of control and a crucially high degree of competence with himself, his dive partner, and the support team. You can, you see, can see some underwater here and here. here. As we descend into the 90s, technical diving has come of age. Born when the first aquanaut descended to the underwater realm and shaped by triumphs and tragedies, deep sea diving operations now carry the torch. By taking advantage of advanced equipment technology, hyperbaric research, in the field, cutting, cutting and special application tables, the experienced diver now has the option 
to learning how to safely conduct a dive operation. By optimizing safety and performance through the use of alternate breathing media, proven decompression techniques, formalized training, diver responsibility, and good common sense, we can truly go where no person has gone before. To raise the special, special feelings of the great explorers and satisfy man's genetic quest for adventure and the reason we entered the underwater world in the first place. Fun. Those are my guys. <laughs> Whoops. Hey, looks like we lost the feed real quick. Oh, I we're back now. Yeah, we're back. Yeah, no, that that video is fantastic. Yeah, I'm sorry about the echo, but you know that um, that was that was fantastic. It's uh, it's pretty funny. It's a, it's a good it's a kind of a good light humor uh, approach to you know the seriousness of it, but you know it shows that all divers are the same. We all have fun. That's right, <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah, that cutting torch thing was pretty wild. Billy is a a, a welder, so we mm -hmm. rigged it up so we could go and cut that bell off that uh, shipwreck in the Tortugas. Uh, so, awesome. yeah, surface supplied cutting torch. Yeah, yeah, and I was like, oh, like, do they normally cut it like that? And so, yeah, I haven't seen that. So, it was it was cool, cool, quicker than a saw. I'm sorry. It was quicker than cutting it off with a, a hacksaw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Much better. The um, well, well, awesome. So um, let's also. I know that uh, you got you uh, you were going to talk about um, you were going to have the C two issue of Aquacore. So um, we are in the process of redigitizing Aquacore to make it available to everybody. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, DiveSoft has sponsored the digitization of the Aquacore C2 issue. That was closed circuit C2. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, it was supposed to be up and ready to download today, and it is not. Um, yeah. And this issue, as I said, they're all themed. This this has articles from Walter Stark, who invented the Electrolung, something on a cryogenic uh, scrubber, interview with uh, Bill Stone, Olivia Eastler, Kevin Gurr. It's a great issue. And so um, we're going to make this available, but unfortunately it isn't today. But here's what you can do. If you go to Aquacore dot online so a q u a c o r p s dot online there's just one page right now and you can download this mix issue for free of course you put in your email download the mix issue if you've already downloaded it you don't have to do anything and then as soon as the c2 issue is ready which will be within the week we will email everyone a link to download it so you can get a, a free free copy of uh, c2 uh we also in this issue, uh, let me just hold this up. We're featuring the, the stoned interview, yeah. Bill Stone. And uh, it's, no, it's pretty, we have the address going on the, on the page too, yeah. Oh, good, right. So go there, get a mix issue. If you already have, don't worry about it, you're good. And we will email you with a download uh, link as soon as uh, C2 is available. And thank you, Dicesoft, for sponsoring. I really appreciate that. Yeah, it, it, it's fantastic. And so it's it's so great that you're able to digitize these um, these issues and we're able to kind of spread them out and promote them again. So good. Cool. 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 Um, so the next kind of topic I want to get into is kind of like, you know, the latest research um, as well, you know, what's going on now. It's, you know, you see a lot of folks doing kind of big or not a lot, but you see folks doing big dives using different technologies, different equipment. And so, you know, the, but you're, you know, have a recent article coming out about new findings of inert gas narcosis. And so, yeah, talk about that a little bit. Ah, okay. We were talking about, so I'm, uh, as I mentioned, or as Joe mentioned, I'm a contributing editor and writer for uh, 
uh, Dan Europe Alert Diver. And so uh, we have a, a couple couple interesting uh, issues just came out. Uh, part, of, part of my job is to take scientific papers and then convert them into articles so to make them a little more readable. And so uh, we just, we have a paper coming out in the next week um, or so on inert, some new findings in inert gas narcosis, really interesting. So one of the problems of studying narcosis is that it's subjective, right? I mean, if you mm -hmm. talk to somebody, they could be at 30 meters and go, yeah, you know, I'm feeling a little good. If you talk to uh, Brett Gillum, he could be at 90 meters on air doing uh, calculus and he's gone, you know. <laughs> so how do you objectively measure? So um, there's a, a device, uh, a technology called CFFF, Critical Flicker Fusion Frequency. So this mm -hmm. is the frequency at which uh, if you take a blinking light and make it go faster and faster, at some point it just appears steady. And that frequency of flicker, when it appears steady, is called your critical flicker fusion frequency. Fusion frequency. Yeah, the CFF, yeah. it's right. like a helicopter it, when, when a video, right? Right. So helicopter wings look like they're standing still. So yeah. it turns out that CFF is used for um, studying uh, narcotics and drugs, the effect on the nervous system, um, and that frequency is kind of in, tuned into our, our nervous system. So when it increases, that means your, your brain is functioning, you're acute. Uh, when it decreases, it means you're a little impaired. Your, your so, responsive is impaired, yeah. Yes. And fortunately, it's very easy to administer. You have a, a tube with a blinking light and the diver looks at it and it turns the knob until it appears steady. And then the researcher notices that. Yeah, we got a picture here. So um, one of the, Dan, the actually the director of research for Dan Europe, uh, Costantino Balestra and others did this a series of studies. And so what they did was they uh, sent divers down to 30 meters for, I think it was 20 minutes, uh, roughly a no-stop dive, on, um, and then recorded their, few, uh, their this frequency. So the way they did it, they took a baseline at the surface, whatever your frequency is, because it's different for different people and, and maybe different by day. Uh, they recorded that, and that was baseline 100%. So then they, they put the divers down. Uh, and then every they, they measured them right on ascent, and then in 15 minutes, and then upon surfacing, and then 30 minute post dive. And they, this first experiment, they did this in a pool, a deep pool in Europe, the Nemo pool. They did it in open water, uh, and just hold those slides there, yeah, because I'll, I'll get to them. Open water, and then they did it uh, in what was the other in a chamber, so dry and two wet cases, and they found exactly the same pattern. It's shown on this graph on the left. So what happens is when you first go down, you're not narked, you're to 30 meters, you descend, and the brain is activated. It's it comes alive, you're clear. And then mm -hmm. after that, the nitrogen starts kicking in, and uh, 15 minutes into it, you are narked. That, that middle dotted line is the baseline, so you can see on ascent, the left, it's higher. Then you go way down. And then even upon surfacing, that impairment lasts 30 minutes post-dive. So you're not 100%. So the second graph now for a, a, additional experiment, there's something called the psychology uh, psychological experimental building language. This is a series of tests that measure uh, cog co your cognitive functioning, et cetera. And uh, so one is like a math test, one is like a whack-a-mole, like how fast you respond, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So put on that other graph with the three, the one with we the have there. Yeah. 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 So what they found is that the CFFF measurement tracks very closely, as you can see, the, uh, the uh, psychological experimental building language, the PEBL test. So what this shows is that this is a good measure of impairment, uh, and it's much easier to administer than a, a math quiz underwater, which you have to do on a computer. So anyway, once they established that this is a good measure, they went and they looked, compared an air dive to a Nitrox 32 dive, again, the 30 meters. And, and now you can go to the colored graph. 
And then, yeah. There you go. They found this exact same pattern. However, what they found is with nitrox, you're not as impaired. Uh, both both air and nitrox, when you first ascend, you're acute. And then with the nitrox, you can see the blue squares. You're, you're just impaired. Uh, you're mm -hmm. impaired when you're surface and you're impaired after the dive. Where the nitrox, uh, you're good to go. And then it's pretty much at baseline. So even though there's a belief that nitro oxygen is narcotic, and it is, at certain partial pressures, this shows that actually uh, you're less impaired on nitrox than air. And the thinking behind it is, I notice a lot of dive courses still use the old theory of the Meyer uh, Overton, Meyer Overton theory that says yeah. the narcotic potential of a gas is directly related to its uh, fat solubility. That's an mm -hmm. old, and that's still true, it's still believed, but the newer theory is that oxygen and nitrogen act on the uh, neurotransmitter receptors in our brain. Uh, oxygen tends to activate them, to excite them and make them up, and nitrogen suppresses them, suppresses dopamine and stuff like that. And so inhibitor, they, yeah. Yeah, an inhibitor. So what they think is happening in here is that the oxygen is basically waking up the brain, the nitrogen is putting it asleep, and the balance between the two is what uh, produces this result. So uh, this is kind of the latest in uh, inert gas narcosis research. That's interesting. That that spike as you're descending, you have that high like that high PO two hitting your your tissues and your in the neurological system, and it's just like gets you real sharp, and then you taper off as yes. kind of everything kind of equalized and essentially the nitrogen gets into the tissues. Right. And imagine, imagine the spike when all of us get to go diving again. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to, it's going to be rough. So that, that's, that's funny. Yeah. That, um, yeah, it's some in really interesting stuff, and uh, it's exciting to see that the research is still going on. It's not like, okay, this is what we know of narcosis. All right. That's it. You know, and then you know, we have new tools uh, like the um, the Azoth, the Oath Dive, kind of that, yeah. that portable uh, Doppler. Let me talk about this. So I'm, I'm working on a story on this for in-depth. Um, so this, this little hockey puck here is actually a, a bubble measuring device. Rather than a Doppler, which is over your heart, this goes, you have to go into your shirt, but it's you put it on your collarbone, as, as in the picture, and uh, you take a measurement of your bubbles 30 minutes post dive. So it works with your smartphone app. So what happens is the, you can see this picture, the smart, you put it on, the smartphone says, yeah, you got a good position. And then it, you breathe and hold it and follow the pattern on your smartphone to get a good reading. Um, Constantino, who I just mentioned has just completed uh, a trip called Apocalypse trip now that they did in March and they took these out and were using these comparing the readings to Doppler and the fact is that they and I know Dan US is also doing research on this that they seem to track really pretty well the readings with uh, with Doppler readings but they don't require the expertise that a Doppler reading does so so once you have that you upload it to the Azoth cloud along with mm -hmm. your dive profile from your dive computer and it comes back and gives you a little graphic. You can see it here. It number one tells you how much deco stress you had on your dive. And this is based on your actual dive, your bubble score. And they have a database of about 10,000 dives, uh, wow. which military dives, commercial dives, and, and now a growing number of sport dives. So they can measure your decompression stress. And then mm -hmm. it actually gives you a what if. So you can say, well, God, on that dive, you can see I was, uh, how does this scale go? 46, I, I had a good a good amount of stress on this dive, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what would happen if I added 10 minutes more of deco? What would happen if I boosted my O2 instead of going to a, you know, instead of going to O2, I went to a 50 mix first, et cetera. What if I up my helium? What if I change my gradient factors? So you basically do it on a slider and the device shows you what your decompressed stress would be. So I don't want to say that they, uh, so this is still under study. Uh, from mm -hmm. Tilden, the uh, research director, Dan, I asked her about this. So how, what do you think of the algorithm? And she goes, it's a black box. So 
Um, I, I'm sure they've done a really good job of this. I don't quite understand how it works. You're I think it's right? brilliant, right? Because you can do your dive, see how it went, and then adjust your factors and go dive again. So the concept's brilliant. Uh, and I'm interested in how the algorithm actually works and, and computes the what ifs. So that that is still unknown. So I don't want to endorse that part, but right. it's a really interesting device. And I, I think it's, you know, it's a product you can buy, but it's under a thousand bucks and it's pretty darn cool. So kind of the latest. Yeah. That's exciting. That's, um, you know, and I wonder how, because we're also learning a lot more about how cold stress really impacts our decompression strategy and whatnot. And, mitigating that and so if that could be like okay well this will add a buffer factor of one or of two if you're diving in a seven mil or if you're diving in a dry suit undergarments heated undergarments and whatnot so just and so you should also be able to see how your bubble scores vary on a given dive with different uh equipment i, I should note too frauk is going to be your next guest i think next yeah. week Tillman, yeah. yeah right he's brilliant and uh, you're really going to enjoy it for sure yeah, next week, uh, Frank Tillman and uh, Mike Peterson are going to be joining us on Dive Talk. So it's going to be a special two guest episode. So oh, cool, cool. Yeah, and um, yeah, it, it's uh, some exciting stuff on on with the as of the O dive, and um, and then you know the future of diving. You know, right now the way it's you know I'm curious to see, like next week we're also going to be talking about this too, but we're gonna. It's it's interesting how the industry is kind of coping with this basically the moratorium of, of the month of everything kind of stops and uh, how the diving industry is handling with the COVID-19. You recently came out with an article that you worked with uh, with another author. I can't remember his name and um, talking about how everyone's been kind of adapting. We, uh, I have a piece out. It's, it's actually in the Dan, Dan Europe blog. And I also mm -hmm. referring to the piece with Stephen Whelan from Deeper Blue. We did a piece on that. Yeah. But also I uh, did this piece on uh, how the diving industry is contributing to the fight on, on uh, the pandemic. So mm -hmm. um, you have uh, companies like uh, your company, DiveSoft, uh, Alex, mm -hmm. Alex uh, helping to make a, a low-cost, uh, high-tech ventilator to you know, yeah. serve ventilator needs. Um, also, uh, Blue 3, which is uh, part of uh, Brownie's third lung group, uh, they are working on one. Uh, Martin Parker has developed with uh, AP Diving, has developed uh, an oxygen flow device that you can hook onto a scuba cylinder and get a stream of oxygen at the right, the right amount uh, for wow. patients. Uh, he did this because he was approached by the hospital saying we're getting all these patients in and their oxygen levels are like critically low before they wow. even go into intubation or anything. So he developed that. We have uh, Ocean Reef and Mari's have, you've probably seen the full face masks that can be with ventilation. Um, Waterlust uh, is making uh, masks. Uh, Santi, <laughs> the, the great dry suit people uh, are uh, making PPE for people. And then we have, a lot of researchers. I know in uh, Dan, Dan Europe, a lot of the researchers uh, uh, are working with, you know, working with patients uh, on COVID and focusing on that right now. So, uh, the, you know, we have a lot of expertise in the diving community and we're we're helping in the fight, you know, until we can go diving again. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's going to be interesting to see um, what changes are, are going to stick. You know, we've been like with this kind of live stream, we've been using it as a great tool to keep the community connected and keep everybody talking, focusing on kind of the community aspect of it. And, you know, we we also with Covair that we've developed um, kind of tools to help with the industry and with the fight and that. And so, yeah. We're all it's, in it's, we're all yeah, we're all in it together and we're all adapting. And so, yeah. <laughs> By hook and by crook, yeah. <laughs> right, and you know the the future is it's very exciting. I mean, there's there's some really interesting stuff coming into into kind of stuff coming out and that you have been kind of investigating a little about about yourself. The the technical free diving, that's mm. something that's kind of like it's two like it's two groups that are on the far end of the spectrum that they're meeting. Yes. So, so that term technical freediving was uh, coined by Kirk Kroc, 
who is the founder of uh, Performance Freediving International. They just merged with uh, International Learning, uh, TDI, SDI, those, that group. Um, yeah. And so the idea for this came out of an experience Kirk had. And uh, uh, basically, if you pre of course, you people go, what? Mixed gas? How, how could freedivers use mixed gas? Well, if you're going to go underwater, you're, you are going to consume mixed gas, whether it's just in your lungs, small tanks, or you got tanks on your back or a rebreather. So everybody is consuming compressed gas underwater. And as we know, compressed air is for tires. So why wouldn't freedivers want to benefit from mixed gas technology? So the key insight, this was something that Kirk had, was that breath hold, the bre world record of a breath hold. Yeah, why, uh, well, that's not quite in order. Well, that's, anyway, we'll get to that. So if you hold your breath and you pre-breathe oxygen, the world record is 24 minutes for breath hold. If you just breathe air and hold your breath, yeah, that's it. The record is like 11 minutes for guys, and I think it's a, it's a little less for women. Uh, so what's going on with that? Wow, interesting. Yeah. Well, how about if we breathe mixed gas? So Kirk Kroc realized this uh, early on, and so uh, so the new thing is now you pre-breathe. Now, I think we can go to that next slide. Well, it's not coming, but the idea is uh, is pre-breathe. Oh, here it is. Pre-breathe and post-breathe, you know, an enriched air nitrox mix to enhance your dive. Not helium, because helium goes into tissues fast, comes out fast, and particularly in free diving, you're having fast ascents, right? Because you're trying mm -hmm. to get back to uh, be able to breathe. So uh, helium might cause decompression problems. But the advantages of this is that it reduces your inert gas, so you're less likely to get bent. You don't usually get bent on a single free dive, but if you're if you're doing repetitive dives, you, you can get bent. It allows you to stay down underwater longer on a breath hole. This is very important. And, and all the things we know about nitrox. If you spend a day free diving, it reduces your fatigue and overall stress, et cetera. So there's really some good, some good reasons to uh, free dive with nitrox, basically. Uh, yeah. And, and there's some thought. Well, we'll get to that. So that's, that's the idea of it. Yeah, I, that's something I, I want to try to really see is like, okay, is there a big advantage? And so, so there's, I think we have a slide of the expeditions. Oh, let's go mm -hmm. forward. Flip a slide forward, Matt, if you're hearing me. Well, wow. yeah. um, so Kirk and his group have been experimenting with this using scooters to pre-breathing nitrox and then using scooters to reduce your consumption. And so they're doing dives to anywhere from 30 to like 50, 60 meters for four minute, five minute bottom time. So pretty impressive, you know. Uh, and it has uses, I think the early uses also will be for safety, like uh, uh, safety divers at a free diving competition. They're making 50, 60 dives going up and down all day. So they're getting decompression stress and other things. So. By uh, breathing nitrox, they can they can sound. These are a couple of the pioneers, as I mentioned, Kirk Kroc and John Holverton with uh, PFI Holverson um, doing this. This is them in truck, and this other guy you may recognize, Eric Fatah. He invented the Liquivision computer. He's a world, yeah, yeah, yeah. world record free diver. So he's been experienced. The way he does it, see that pony bottle on his arm? He carried mm -hmm. a little pony bottle of nitrox, breathes at the surface, does his dive. He was saying, like, if he hears boats, he can take a breath underwater and just wait it out and then surface. <laughs> of course, danger, danger, breathing compressed gas underwater, you have to let it out or you're going to embolize. But, you know, that's that's pretty manageable. So these these are the people who are really pioneering this. And I think, I don't know, for me, like, why, again, why, why wouldn't I breathe nitrox and be able to double my bottom time? And, and the uh, hypothesis is, before we get to the risks and the unknowns, the mm -hmm. hypothesis is the biggest risk in free diving is hypoxia, that you pass right. out. And if you're diving alone, which is a huge no-no in free diving, and you don't have a buddy, then you're just going to drown, right? Because you're going to pass mm -hmm. out underwater, exhale, I mean. sink. Yeah. So, um so it's the thinking is that maybe by breathing nitrox, we can pretty much eliminate the risk of hypoxia. In other words, you'll have to breathe before you black out. So mm -hmm. anyway, 
In so the, next, like, the obvious risks um, from this are CNS toxicity. Uh, can you breathe pure O2, uh, breathe up, and then do a dive to 40 meters? Would you tox? The thinking is you probably wouldn't because it's a lot of it's in solution, it's in your lungs, you're consuming it on the way down, but no one knows. If you breathed O2 and dove to 40 meters on a breath hold and did it 10 times, might you tox? Yeah, maybe tox. So, so that's a risk. Uh, you can get more CO2 narcosis because your CO2 is building up further. So, so, and then there's the obvious risk of just handling, uh, you know, oxygen and nitrox and stuff like that. The thing is, this is very much like early tech diving because it's exciting right. and shit. And there's just a ton that's not known. I think that next slide talks about what's not known. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah, we don't know what the CNS limits are on breath hold. And it's going to be hard to find out because you won't be able, it'll, it'll be hard to do an experiment where you send people underwater on a breath hold and see when they talk. Right? It's going to be hard to study, but it needs to be done. Uh, so we don't know about that. We don't know how much surface intervals can be shortened using mix, not known yet. Uh, PFI have worked out protocols based on uh, empirical, well, anecdotal data, but we don't know. And also there's nothing known about decompression for free diving. The algorithms we have, I mean, they're in the dive computers, but they really apply to compressed gas divers, not free divers. Mm -hmm. We have a very different kind of profile. So, so that's unknown. So, so let me give you a really cool thought experiment. This was a guy came up with this, Dean Laffin from Australia, a buddy of mine, uh, a lot of you know him. So here's the thing, you hang a O2 cylinder at six meters and you hang a 32 cylinder at say nine meters, maybe 15 meters. So now you breathe up on nitrox and let's say we're gonna go diving to 40 meters, this breath hold, right? Breathe up on nitrox, go do your dive to 40 meters, swim around, scooter, three, four minutes, come back up. You come back up to your 15 meter 32 mix and you breathe it up and then you go back down and dive and you just keep rinsing and repeating. So maybe you spend an hour at uh, 40 minutes uh, diving and then the last stop, you come up to your six meter oxygen cylinder and you decompress. How long? Yeah. You don't know, because there's no algorithms for this. I mean, you could use a new algorithm, but isn't that wild? So call it hybrid. Yeah, that is wild. I, mean, I can see people doing this in wrecks and caves and like, you know, <laughs> I like, I don't, I don't like it. Yeah. I mean, the beauty of free diving is you don't have all the gear, right? You're just you mm -hmm. pretty much well goggles and fins <laughs> and an exposure suit, but that's it. So uh, yeah, spend an hour at 40 meters on a breath hold. Anyway, I think that's the future. That's coming. Yeah, that, that's an interesting topic that it will definitely become more prevalent, especially like, you know, sitting in Jenny Springs in the in the eye, we're sitting on Deco, and then you have free divers all day. They're coming in, they go up to the sign, they look a little bit more, they go to the sign, they look a little more, and they push it, and it's it's just, I can see all the divers around here, we just get real nervous. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> when I, got, I don't want to yeah. grab them. Free diving in an overhead environment is uh, a little scary. Yeah. Back up, right? You can't go to your buddy and say, I'm out of gas. You know, you're right, crazy, right. You're crazy, so. It's not that much gear to bring with you. And so, right. uh, if for those interested in this subject, uh, I wrote a, a long article about it called Technical Diving, our breath hole, uh, Technical Free Diving, our breath hole. Uh, our free divers ready. I, I can't remember the title. It's in deeperblue.com. So, Go look it up. Technical so at deeperblue.com, huh? Yeah. yeah. Well, well, man, we've talked. We've talked about so much. We talked about the past, the present, and like the future. And then, so let's let's remind everyone to go to Aquacore. Uh, was it Aqu Aquacore.com? Aquacore dot online. There you go. Dot online. Yeah, there you go. Sign up, and you can download. We have a free issue of uh, kind of the first free issue of the mix. And then we'll have this second issue coming out very soon. Yeah, which is one of Aquacore's better issues, I think. Oh, yeah, I think they're all great. <laughs> Thank you. Well, fantastic. Well, it was so good having you. And, um, you know, we were supposed to be diving right now, um, but uh, we'll, be, we'll be diving soon, right? And so I was going to be out doing my uh, Liberty course with you this last couple of right? weeks. 
going to tech. Yeah. Together, so, uh, yeah, we were going to be out diving in the keys and having a good time. So <laughs> I know. <laughs> Darn. So we got a rain check on that, but it'll be soon. <laughs> yes. Mm. All right. Well, thank you everyone for, for thank watching uh, this episode of Dive Box. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share and everything. So thank you very much. And we'll see you again next week.